We'll go ahead and get started. Um, good evening. Uh, my name is Katie Owney. I'm the Assistant Dean for External Relations here at Merrill College. Um, so just want to welcome people to our panel this evening. Um, this is the fourth of four Alumni Career Week panels that we're doing. Um, so this, tonight we'll be talking about um, careers in uh, government and politics and, and nonprofit communications. Um, just a couple notes, we are recording this um, and we encourage you to um, ask questions in the chat as we go along um, or raise your hand if you have any questions. So I'm gonna turn things over now um, to Adrian Flynn who will be moderating this evening. Hi everybody, I'm Adrienne Flynn and I'm the Internship and Career Development Director for the Philip Merrill College of Journalism. A lot of our panelists I know I've known since they were, you know, in our college. So it's kind of cool to see you all come back. So thank you and welcome. I really appreciate you being here. Um, you know, last night I moderated a panel and I kind of introduced everybody um, and I had my little prepared paragraphs. and. Tonight, I think I'm just gonna let our panelists kind of introduce themselves because they all have kind of an interesting trajectory. I have all their bios in front of me, um, you know, in getting from Merrill College to um, their current um, communications careers. So um, I'm just gonna quickly tell you who they are and then I'm gonna call on them one by one and they can tell you kind of how they got there. So we have Jeff Bergen and he is a political communicator who um, worked in Arizona for the Biden-Harris campaign. We have Jennifer Bogdan Jones, who's director of presidential communications to President Paxton at Brown University. We have Raymond Flandes, who's a communications officer for the US Holocaust Memorial Museum. Um, we have Kate, Casey, Itayero, who is Managing Director of Communications at the Joyce Foundation. And Tessa, I didn't copy your bio, so tell me what, we're going to start with you and you can tell me what it is you're doing right now. I know where you came from, but I don't know where you are right now. Hi, I'm Tessa Track. I graduated from Maryland in 2017 from Merrill College, of course, and I currently work at World Central Kitchen. I'm the communications associate. I've been working there remotely um, for about the last 10 or 11 months. But before that, I worked as an associate dean at an all-girls boarding school where I oversaw the service learning and leadership aspect of um, the students and their roles there. And what I learned from being in um, at Merrill and in journalism school was that I love people and I love sharing their stories. And I didn't, I figured out by the end that I didn't want to go start somewhere at 3 a.m. in Iowa. So I figured out how to take that love and the knowledge that I learned and turned it into something else. And so now as the communications associate, I um, handle all the initial form of communication that comes to World Central Kitchen, like our main inbox, all of our communications on social media, and then some external things like newsletters, um, PowerPoint decks that go out to all the kinds of people, and then managing our uh, massive media and video library as well. So I'm going to turn to Casey Itayero because um, Katie uh, just put a an article in the chat about her um, uh, being mentioned in an article. So I'll let her talk about um, her history and what she's mm -hmm. doing. Sure. So um, I am, as you said, the uh, Managing Director of Communications at the Joyce Foundation. Um, we're a Chicago-based uh, regional foundation, um, nonpartisan private foundation that does um, invest in public policy grant making. I mean, sorry, public policy making. Uh, through grants to a variety of organizations, primarily um, like research-based organizations, um, working in five major program areas, um, gun violence prevention and criminal justice reform, um, democracy, which um, also um, includes work um, with media, um, environment, uh, education, economic mobility, and our and culture. And so I have been at Joyce about three years in the role as managing director, it's sort of a third, a third, a third. And so I manage sort of all, all things communications for Joyce, all of the ways in which we interface with the world, I manage that. Um, I also manage our journalism grant making portfolio. And um, I, as the managing uh, part of my title, um, I sit on the leadership team and help to um, advise the president and vice president on a variety of foundation matters. 
That's cool. And you were GM of the Chicago Steam. Yes, yes. Um, like I've coolest, had coolest resume <laughs> item I've seen. <laughs> yeah, I've had many, many uh, different um, roles in, in my career since I left um, Maryland. I graduated in 2000. And um, one of them was a stint um, as a part owner and general manager of a minor league basketball team based in Chicago. All right. Well, we may we may end up coming back to that. I don't know. Okay. That's a pretty cool resume item. Okay. Raymond Flandes, tell us how you got to be the Holocaust Memorial Museum's uh, communications officer. Thanks for having me here. Uh, it's really nice to see everyone and just from different classes too. Uh, I graduated from Maryland in 2004 and embarked on a journalism career in New York uh, for the Wall Street Journal. And then um, after that, for the Chronicle of Philanthropy, covering nonprofits and, and fundraising. I did that for, you know, that whole journalism career for 10 years. And, you know, I thought it would be nice to just go to the nonprofit world um, head first. And uh, thankfully, the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum had an opening and I was uh, brought in. Uh, it was also nice because they also were hiring a lot of former journalists as well. So uh, now I've been there ever since. I oversee the communications from um, local to regional and even international. We get about 550 requests from media all over the world uh, per year. So it's a uh, turnaround time, experts this and experts that. And, but it's been fun. It's, it works like a newsroom, but we have a lot of help from plenty of people um, relaying the world relating to the world that we're an educational institution uh, and a memorial to the Holocaust survivors. Cool. Jennifer, you want to go next? Tell us how you got to be, uh, you know, a communications director at a university. Kind of by accident. <laughs> 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 um, similar to Raymond. Um, so I spent uh, 10 years in print journalism. Um, I thought that's what I would do for my entire career. And I know a lot of people have a similar story. Um, but, you know, after about 10 years for a bunch of reasons, um, I, I knew that it wasn't going to work long term and I needed to transfer my skills. And um, so I've, I've had a couple of career changes um, over a very short period of time. So I went um, from report my the last paper I was with was the Providence Journal. I was a state house reporter. I went right from covering the state house to working for the governor. Um, so I was hired as her deputy communications director, and that was quite a leap from journalism into inside the walls of the state house, and then quickly went to being her her full communications director. Um, and then just a few months ago, I moved over to Brown. Um, so I've gone from <laughs> into politics and now into into uh, university life, um, and so. Um, what I do now, um, I mainly, I'm responsible for all communications that are distributed by the president. Um, and so uh, that means I, I write her speeches, I do video scripts, I do letters, remarks for all public events. I oversee all communications that come to the president's office. I do some planning of um, what types of lectures and public events she's gonna attend. Um, similarly, when I was in the in the governor's office, I did also did a lot of speech writing, but that role was a lot more um, strategic communications, um, a lot. And so, what I found, and sort of why I'm in um, uh, the university world now, is that I feel like as a as a trained journalist, my favorite piece of everything that I do is writing. <laughs> and so, I feel like I think a lot of us feel this way. We're storytellers. We know how to. Um, get at the heart of, you know, what really makes us, you know, what, what part of a story really makes you feel. And so my favorite part of what I've done across all jobs has been to tell other people's stories. And so now I have more of an opportunity to focus on that rather than some of the strategic management pieces. Gotcha. Uh, I guess Jeff Bergen is next. Hey, it's good to, good to be with you all. Um, you know, I, as, as, as Adrian just mentioned, you know, I last year was uh, the director of communications for the Biden campaign in Arizona. Um, and to say it was an unusual experience would be an understatement because, you know, 15 feet down the hallway at our kitchen table is where in Washington, D.C. is where I did three quarters of that campaign. I was in Phoenix for the last month um, as about as unusual a campaign cycle as you'll as you'll ever see. Um, also worked in Iowa during that cycle, and uh, also you know, prior to that was Andrew Gillen's communications director of Florida for his gubernatorial campaign. So 
have had a number of things worked on Capitol Hill as well. Um, you know, uh, Merrill, as I've told some students this week when I've been on the phone with them, you know, the writing background that the university gives you uh, and the college gives you is, is, is as good a background and foundation as you're going to need for anything. And, and I think we can see from the folks on this call, like you can literally do anything uh, yeah. without foundation. I've, I've found myself in a, a, what I've also told these students is a very non-linear path to get here. I haven't necessarily worked one over the other over the other in terms of jobs. And I think a lot of us can, can empathize uh, with that, with that uh, path. Awesome. So uh, tell me, so since I have you, Jeff, why don't you tell me the major differences between um, straight journalism for you mm -hmm. and communications now? Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, sort of compare and contrast the two for me. Yeah, you know, I think, I think that there is through, you know, popular culture in no small part, um, there's a perception that my job as somebody who speaks on behalf of politicians or political campaigns, that my job is to, to lie uh, or to obfuscate, you know, and, and I think what's, what's core, what should be, what's at the core of good practices in both is truth and facts. The difference is that on my side that I currently sit on, there's a, you know, there's a, a strategic piece that goes into whether you're going to choose to, you know, engage with the story. Good journalists are going to chase stories. Good journalists are going to write stories. Some of them you're going to love and some of them you're not going to love so much. And there's a discretion piece that comes in on my, on my side uh, and a strategic piece that comes in on my side. But I think the core of good communications and good journalism, as we all know, is fact, truth. You know, I think one of the things that I've talked to Katie about over the, the last couple of months is like protecting that basis is really, really important, no matter which side of the microphone or recorder uh, you're on right now. But I think it's, uh, I think they're, they're commonly rooted at their best. So Casey, how about you take that as well? Tell me a little bit about how you compare and contrast these two, you know, the journalism education that you got and the practice that you put into it and the current um, communications positions. Um, I mean, I use my journalism training every day um, in my job, both, um, you know, as a couple of the panelists have said in terms of just the writing, you know, like all of the storytelling aspects of the job, um, but it also um, knowing how to sort of quickly um, synthesize information, like the reporting skills come in very handy, um, particularly um, we, our programs are very uh, policy dense and they are, it's sort of almost, it's almost like doing communications for five separate foundations under one roof because they, the level and depth of the work across the programs is just, is just so vast. And so having the ability to be able to get up to speed quickly on issues and to be able to toggle between issues. Um, a lot of times in one day, you know, I'm doing various communications pieces for four or five completely different topics um, and being able to juggle those, um, that those are skills that, you know, I developed um, for my journalism training. And then, you know, with the management of the journalism portfolio, right? Like having been a journalist and having that training is the lens through which I look um, as I think about our media investments and how to um, support um, current journalists and how to support news outlets and thinking about ways to build for the future of the business. So, I mean, every, every day I, every day I go to work, um, I use those skills. Tasa, why don't you compare and contrast what you're doing? I think I was on the broadcast track, but I still have that, um, the writing base. And I think that's super important because like I said, I'm answering communications all the time. And mm -hmm. when writing something, any, I know that it needs to be concise and to the point, but also have like a, a pleasant spin on it because I may be the only communication these people ever have with World Central Kitchen. So it needs to oh. be factual, but also pleasant at the same time. And through my broadcast training, I've learned a lot about um, storytelling from the visual sense. So when managing our photo library and telling our stories on Instagram, mainly every day. Um, it's like choosing the photos or figuring out the best 
the best way or the best order in which to share the stories, the photos or the videos or choosing photos for a slide deck or for putting together for press, you need to make sure you have the branding and make sure like the shot is visually appealing with all the things I learned about rule of thirds and balance and all those other things. So I'm using those skills in a different way than I had envisioned and working with journalists on the other side kind of because we um, give, we are in contact with press all the time. They're covering us in whatever disaster area or good things we're doing lately. Right now, most recently we were in Texas um, bringing food and water to people that were without power. So working with journalists all over um, the state and people reaching out in all those different avenues that we learned how to be um, how to pursue when we were in school, like reaching out on Twitter, reaching out on email or reaching out on Instagram DM. Sometimes it's three from the same person. And I know that they're just doing their job. Like, I don't find it annoying. I'm like, oh, you really did your homework. Like you're trying to get the right story. So I think I have a good respect for the persistence of the journalists and I can appreciate it. And we also work with a, a PR person who is knows like which journalists are going to tell our story the way we want it to be told and which journalists are not always the ones we choose so it's kind of interesting to see it from the other perspective as well especially coming from a group that usually has good things to share like we're doing good work and there's not a lot of bad press thankfully um but it's definitely been really interesting and i found that the my skills in how to tell a visual story have come into handy way more than i had anticipated so Jeff gives your Instagram a shout out. Um, I don't know if you saw that in the chat, but well, if you DM us, I'll be the one responding. So <laughs> feel free to say hi. So tell me about the respect on the other end. So we'll, we'll go this way. So, you know, I'm like all journalists all the time, but I, you know, I've worked with communications people and politics and, um, you know, you really get to know a lot of these communications directors really well. Um, you kind of hit it off with some of them and, you know, just want to snarl at the other ones. And so tell me about the other side of the street. You know, did you expect journalists to be more respectful or are they really respectful and you're surprised by that? Uh, that's a good question. I would say most of them are pretty direct. They're like, hi, I work for this place. I live in this place and I need to talk to someone about this thing. It's very short and sweet usually because they need to get their info and they just want it quickly, which I appreciate rather than some people that just message and they say like, hi, can you help me? And I have a lot of follow-up questions in that case rather than like telling me all the information you need up front. Um, and, and some people when sharing our story, getting the facts straight of um, like how much we're paying per meal and how many meals we're serving and the names of the locations and the names of our chefs and what's in the ingredients of the meal. So taking the time to get those facts straight and ask follow-up questions when, when we might not have provided all that information or they just don't understand something upon initial um, request. And I would say most people have been very pleasant. I've had no negative interactions in my, <laughs> in my world. Um, but we did have a recent journalist who some backstory is that we've been paying restaurants to provide meals for their communities as part of a program called Restaurants for the People. And we um, acquired a company or an organization called Frontline Foods that was um, that was started during the pandemic and doing a similar thing, paying restaurants to provide meals. And so they were paying restaurants a different price than World Central Kitchen was at the time. So in this story, it came across as if we were paying restaurant this restaurant less of a, a salary than frontline foods had been and the journalist was like offended when we came back to her to say that this was not correct and like this is you know this was the misunderstanding but she was offended that like we were insulting her skills that she didn't get it right when in reality like it was just there was a lot of moving pieces and it wasn't it wasn't reading in the way that we had thought we shared it if that makes sense. Mm, I think I get it. You know, misunderstandings are pretty common. It happens. <laughs> um, Jeff, tell me about your experience with journalists. Do you think you get, are you getting the respect you deserve? Yeah, overall, you know, I've worked, I, I worked for Governor O'Malley and didn't work as directly with the State House Press Corps there as I did in Tallahassee, where I worked with the State House Press Corps um, a ton, you know, when I was, when I was Mayor Gillen's communications director. You know, at the beginning, I talked about you know the core of, of both sets of our of our work here is is truth and facts. 
what is the human aspect of that is there's unconscious bias. There are things that color people's versions of the truth where they see a number on a piece of paper and they say, well, this is a number that you on the other side as, as a communications director, you can't explain this number to me in a way that makes sense to me. And for on, on my side of it is, well, what your, your question to me is rooted in a, a, a set of biases that you don't perfectly understand. You know, in particular in Florida, an incredibly diverse state, when I was down there in 2017 and 2018, to my memory, a state of 20 million people, as far as I can recall, had maybe one black reporter in the state house. Very few people of color and essentially was a collection of mostly men writing about state government and state politics writ large for a state of 20 million people that as we all know is incredibly diverse. So to the extent that I, I have great respect and relationships with a lot of the Florida press corps, still do stay in touch with a lot of them. Do I think that there are some issues in terms of diversity and biases and perception that need addressed in that state house press corps? And as I'm sure Jennifer and others can attest to have worked with state house press corps, it's an endemic national problem. It's, a, it's, it's something that we've got to work on collectively across the board. You see it on Capitol Hill, you see it on the campaign trail. Um, doesn't mean those folks are wrong, doesn't mean their facts are wrong, but the way that they're approaching their facts is different than you will be representing uh, somebody on the other side of it, especially when you work with candidates or principals or organizations representing people of color. So, so I, I don't want to dwell on that sort of negative aspect of this. I really want to know a lot about your jobs. Otherwise, I turn to Jennifer and Raymond and <laughs> Casey and see um, how everybody else is doing that. But I, I really want you to be able to tell students um, kind of about the, the best things about your jobs. And what I'm hearing from most of you is that you're still storytellers, that communications is a way of telling stories that have a strong impact for you. Um, you know, Jeff is, you know, for the, you know, the Biden-Harris ticket. Um, you know, let's turn to Raymond. I mean, I know your work at the Wall Street Journal. Um, you're a great storyteller, a wonderful writer. Um, do you get to use those muscles as a Holocaust Museum communications director? And, and what are the best aspects of your job? Sure. I think, you know, coming in from a, um, I guess, a journalism standpoint, I know what journalists have been through. And I love the fact you know, without them, we can't do our jobs. We, there are more communications people than journalists. And so um, working, you know, I've always given the benefit of the doubt to the journalists and the journalists I've been, you know, involved with and, and worked with, they've been really great. But what I want to do is basically what Tessa said is to make the story fuller, to make, to have nuances in their stories rather than just, Here's what happened, you know, this is what's going on. I want them to interview Holocaust survivors or, you know, someone who's affected um, by, you know, you know, a refugee in Burma, um, you know, make it as compelling as possible. And I come it, through it that way and I help them that way. And, you know, I help craft those vignettes as well. And so they're at the ready when the journalists need them. And, if they, they don't respond, I like, hey, can we talk again? I have this person for you. I'm sure Jennifer can attest to that as well. I was just gonna ask Jennifer if she misses the independence of journalism, because I mean, you're writing speeches for somebody and someone else's voice now mm -hmm. and thinking about how they might shape these particular words. Um, how do you feel about that aspect of your job? I mean, I think the, be the best part about writing for somebody else is sort of, I mean, well, getting to write for somebody who delivers something out loud is a very cool thing. Um, and you hear your words come to life in a different way. Um, what I would say if to somebody who's thinking about that as a, as a career path is you do have to set aside your ego a little bit. And I think we all know that journalists can have a bit of an ego in this way that you want to tell your story, right? And we all know how to like dig in with our editors and say, no, that's not the lead. This is the lead. And that's sort of a nice rapport that we were, we're used to. Um, 
in what I do now, you know, you have to capture somebody's voice and that has to, it has to sound like them, you know, they're not going to sound like me. And so there's, there's nuance to that and just sort of capturing like what sort of vocal tics do people have. There's also um, a point of, you know, are you somebody who tells stories with data or are you somebody who tells stories with, hey, I was walking down the street the other day and I saw Adrian and this is what happened, you know? And each principal that you work with is gonna have a different style. And, you know, you have to be willing to say, well, you know, my role here is to, you know, make you or the organization, you know, sound good, tell your story in a way that's, that's most effective. Do I miss like getting to <laughs> dictate more of that? Of course I do. A part of me will, will always miss journalism and always miss sort of chasing a story. The thrill of that is like, oh. <laughs> it doesn't, um, but like, you know, I do feel like we've at least found, I've at least found a way that it translates and it's really fulfilling and so cool to see somebody else deliver that. You know, some people just don't like that chasing the story thing. You know, some people, you know, some people don't, uh, I don't understand them, but, but uh, yeah. no, I'm kidding. But, you know, some people just don't, don't love that part of the job. And, you know, I think some of those people tend to gravitate toward communications or other rules in um, what we do. Um, well, I got you, Jennifer. Why don't you tell me um, what, kind of advice you might pass along and I'm going to ask everybody this um, and you all can jump in after this um, you have for our young you know journalism majors um, who are thinking maybe this is not for me maybe I want to go into communications what should they know what should they prepare for what should they what advice do you have for them well, I would say the most important thing that I've learned since I've switched careers and come onto the communication side is that to me, it very much matters who I'm working for. I never thought I would be on this role. Um, and I kind of had that, I think we all, we all do this in J school, right? You talk about like, oh no, I, I want to be independent. I, you know, I don't want to be part of the, of the machine, sort of what Jeff was talking about before. And believe me, we're not all, we're not all bad on this side, certainly not. Um, but it matters that, you know, it's not just any organization. There's a lot of like public relations firms and they, many of them do great work. But for me, that wouldn't work because I don't wanna just be handed a, a set of issues and told to promote them. I wanna do research into, you know, the, the person that I'm with, the organization that I'm with. And for me, the, the governor that I was working for and now the university that I'm working for, I really believe in their mission. Um, and so that makes it less about the spin and more about, you know, putting forth work into something that you care about. Um, the other piece of advice I'd give is that the thing that has always stuck with me from Jay's school is that like that tick of like, how do I know that? Um, never give up that tick because <laughs> people will make, well-meaning people will make mistakes. They'll hand you the wrong data. They'll, you know, tell you the wrong anecdote. And, you know, when you're, you're fact checking that when you're a reporter, but if you're in one of our roles, you know, or for me specifically, I'm thinking like, if I hand that piece of information to my principal and they say it from the podium, like <laughs> think about what you would do as the reporter if that principal said that piece of information, you know, um, and they're gonna get fact checked. So never give up that little tick of like, where did that come from? Go back and check again. Yeah. I. You know, I, I think put, putting your person in that position. So I, I tell people all the time in my classes that, you know, you're one of the reasons that communicators want to hire journalists is because of that discipline that we instill about not trying very, very hard not to make an error and being, you know, very precise about your language and what it is you're writing. Because imagine giving a speech to the governor and, you know, you've gotten a few zeros wrong in the budget or something. Oh, I can't, I can't even imagine. Hmm. Casey, you have kind of a, a different uh, overview of this communications field. So tell me what mm -hmm. advice in council you might give some of our young um, reporters thinking about being where you are sometime soon. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, I, I agree with Jennifer. I think, I mean, the single uh, most important piece of advice is just 
wherever you choose to work and do communications, you have to be aligned um, with the um, with the ethos either of the principal or the organization, um, because otherwise you will soon find yourself in a position where you're having to say or do something that just doesn't sit right with you. Um, and it becomes very difficult to, uh, I mean, being a journalist is all about authentic communications. And in order for you to be able to do that in your role as a communications professional, it has to be somewhere where you actually believe what it is you're saying. I mean, it's a novel concept, particularly these days, but the ability to actually work somewhere where you believe the words that are coming out of your mouth um, really, really, really matters. And you, we've seen a lot of examples um, recently of how people really damage um, their uh, personal and professional credibility um, and the perception of their integrity um, when they have to sort of twist themselves and not speak, trying to sort of chase um, Trying to trying to chase whatever sort of the position of the moment is because they because wherever it is they're standing is essentially on quicksand. So I think I just cannot underscore more the importance of just choosing wisely um, in in where you work because you will be um, a, a very much sort of channeling um, either the principal or the organization, and you just want to make sure that like you know you're on the right channel when you do that. So do you think that is the exception or the rule? Do you think people in communications generally just say they're in it for the job and you know it doesn't really matter who they're communicating for? Or do you really think that, like I think most of our panelists are really invested in the, um, in the ideology, the groups, organizations, people that they're representing? Um, I mean, I've seen both. I think that, you know, people who do issues-based communications tend to be true believers um, because there's just so much advocacy in that. Um, I think that you get more of the hired gun and the agency work, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you can't have like meaningful, purposeful agency work. Like there are agencies that are um, issues advocacy PR agencies. So it really is, I think it's less about um, the type of communication that you do, I think regardless of sort of what your interests are, you can find somewhere um, that aligns, you know, with your values. Maybe else want to jump in for some advice to our, our young reporters, young journalists. Sure. Uh, piggybacking on what Jennifer and Casey did, you know, I, I went and, you know, search for a nonprofit I could believe in when I was ready to jump from journalism to the nonprofit world. And it helped that I covered the nonprofit world and, and knew where to go. Um, but one of the things that I also uh, would advise, would give advice to, to students is to be resourceful. Uh, I mean, that kind of, um, you know, instinct to not take no, not take no for an answer is good, you know, cultivate that. Like for example, you know, when I, you know, try to like pitch my story, it's like, where can I go that I know that this would be, you know, welcomed. Um, and I knew friends from all over, you know, journalism, you know, I knew reporters in the Huffington Post and that was the first place I, I pitched to because there was a religion reporter friend that I knew um, and so, Keep those, um, you know, journalism is a small world. And so keep those um, folks in your back pocket if you wanna go um, and also join a journalism organization that you believe in too. Um, Cause they will introduce you to folks that will help you in the long run in your career. So can, so like what, what, what journalism organizations do you uh, belong to? What do you stay on top of? Sure, the Asian American Journalists Association is what you know I belong to, but also um, I remember going to a convention in Vegas uh, where the um, Gay Lesbian Journalists Association were there, and two of the people I met uh, end up being great reporters who covered the arts beat uh, in D.C. And I was able to um, think, hey, I know you, you know these uh, issues, and and they've been great. And so just thinking about what your connections are and, and, and knowing where to pitch and, um, and having that uh, close relationship is good. 
So I have a question from the chat and you might as well take it, Raymond, and then uh, Jeff is answering it in the chat, but we'll go around. Um, do you need to acquire marketing skills to transition to your non-journalism careers? Do you think that's necessary? I don't think so. I didn't have any. Uh, <laughs> I, there might be some people who do, but I think um, I think journalism fits perfectly well. Um, I know that there, you know, there are people in in my area who do more of that marketing skills. We have journalists, former journalists, who do kind of uh, write copy um, and also write for our magazine, um, and those are perfectly great. I. You know, I try to write for that, but I don't have the skills for that. But if you're looking for those kinds of jobs, they're there. Tulsa, how about you? Did you need any marketing skills for the World Central Kitchen? I mean, you came from broadcast. I mean, it was a, you know, I don't think you had any. Did you have a business minor or anything? Yeah, actually, I did have a business minor. So I had a brief knowledge of marketing, but I also worked in the Capital News Service on the social bureau. So more like analytical and social skills. Um, but I think you probably have more marketing skills inherently than you're giving yourself credit for. Um, mm -hmm. And when you transition into a new role, I would say kind of tying it to my advice would just be to try new things. Like you don't need to have every single item that they're looking for when you apply because you can learn as you go. And that's part of what being a journalist is, is like learning on the fly and adapting to your situation and what's being asked of you at that time. So I think that you probably know more marketing and how to you know, sell something because you know what people are looking for. You know how to ask what they want before you give it to them. You have the visual piece. You, have, you can write copy because you know how to write succinctly and find those facts. So you can probably do whatever marketing job you might be looking at pretty well without having a degree in marketing. Uh, anybody else? Jeff, Jeff you want to um, just, you know, you answered yeah. that in the chat. You want to elaborate on that point a little bit? Yeah. Jennifer said something earlier that I, that stuck with me. There's a chase, you know, in journalism school, uh, you know, uh, for those who have that chase instinct inherently, it builds on it and it facilitates it and it grows it. And for those who don't, J School helps helps cultivate it and build it. That sense of initiative drive, you know, and, you know, seeking what's next, whether it's a fact or a source or a skill, like journalism school inherently sort of helps build that in you. So no, I don't. I think as long as you're able to marry sort of the skills, the fact-based writing skills, the tech skills, if you're on a broadcast track. If you're able to marry those sort of hard skills with the intangible initiative and drive that the school teaches you and a good journalism school, you know, is predicated on, you're going to do great. I don't think you need to, uh, you know, go get an MBA certificate or, or what have you. Um, it's, not a Smith, it's not a Smith lecture right now. Casey, anybody else want to jump in on uh, advice or marketing or yes? No, I, I definitely didn't get it, have any um, marketing experience or get any training like that. I mean, I, I get asked a lot about um, additional trainings um, in transitioning from um, journalism to communications. And I think one of the most effective tools in making the transition, um, and Raymond spoke to this earlier, is just sort of mining your networks for people um, who could help you. Um, think about how you could translate the skills that you have to a job that you might want. Um, and particularly for me, I mean, I made the transition. So I was um, a newspaper reporter for Stretch and my last job, um, which brought me to Chicago, um, I was at the Tribune and I had um, consumer column on the business desk. And at the time, um, a guy who was the state treasurer who would go on to run um, for Senate when uh, Barack Obama won in 08 um, was a frequent source of mine for the column. And when he was about to mount his Senate run, um, he asked if, you know, if I'd be interested in coming to work for him. And that was really the first time I thought about doing anything other than journalism. And it was one of those, it was a dynamic where the reason why you know, he had approached me about doing it is because the role was very similar to what I was doing with the column at that time um, in his office, he had 
um, the financial education division, and I'd be essentially doing communications for that division. Um, and then if he won the Senate, then of course there'd be all these other opportunities, but it really was sort of like the other side of the coin of what I was already doing. And so when um, I talked to journalists or journalism students who were like, oh, well, you know, I, I think I want to start off in journalism, but I might want to transition, um, you're beat, right? Like the, the beat, the sources that you talk to every day are some of your best sources of information for how to make the transition. Um, Katie had a question. Um, tell me what your typical day looks like. You want me to take that? Sure. Um, my typical day is usually it's um, lots of like either internal or external meetings. Um, like I said, I uh, my job is sort of a third or third or third. So there's a part that's sort of just um, working with the management team on the running of the foundation. Um, and then there is um, managing various communications projects in support of our staff and support of our programs. But then I do a lot of meetings with grantees. Like I said, I manage the um, journalism portfolio. And so um, I spend a fair amount of my time talking to journalists about um, projects that they're looking for funding on. I'm talking just about the the landscape broadly, just to kind of get a sense of sort of, as, as you know, um, journalism is an ever evolving um, ecosystem. And just, you know, so having a lot of conversations so that we can have a sense of um, where the challenges and opportunities are and how we can best leverage um, our, the resources from the portfolio. So I, I, I do a lot of a lot of conversations with folks. And then, you know, pre-COVID, you know, site visits, I would go, I do a lot of travel um, going to see grantees in action and also going to various um, uh, various events that uh, we either would host or co-host um, in support of the work. Jen, what does your day look like? Um, so very much writing based. Um, I guess, you know, right now it's on a typical day, I'm probably writing at least one set of remarks. And so like, the, like you don't always write the biggest speech. Um, it's not always right now. It's not always the commencement address, though that'll be a thing. But like you know, it's it's remarks for different sorts of meetings. If the president's meeting with a, a group of students or a group of parents, or um, you know, with a certain part of the school, so um, I might I'll write her remarks for that. Um, also, like you might be writing about a, another project that the university is going to launch so letters as well so think like cover letters for you know what is the vision for why are we doing this kind of work so I might be working on on one of those um, and then some long-term planning um, is usually involved so you know what sorts of things should we be thinking about for how are we going to position ourselves either with media in the future or what interviews should we be doing or what events should we be hosting? Um, so I'm probably two thirds of my day I'm writing and maybe one third of my day I'm in meetings or brainstorming. So, it, you know, I welcome audience questions. If you wanna put them in the chat, I'd be happy to, um, to take your questions, but um, I'm curious and anyone can jump in on this. You know, why did you switch? You know, what, what was the thing that prompted you to move from journalism to communications? Is it the money? Because that's what everyone says. <laughs> I've, been, I've been thinking a lot about this recently. I graduated in 11, post-recession, but sort of pre, as I joked with a student earlier this week, in 2011, BuzzFeed was not like a hard hitting journalism website. It was like cat quizzes and like mm -hmm. superhero quizzes. And it was really fun and really great, but the idea that you could have, the idea that there would be really, really robust, primarily almost exclusively online news reporting that covered public affairs, politics, campaigns, didn't occur to me at the time. And at the time, the, the window of it was sort of short. I was more interested in like a lot of guys my age at the time was like really interested in sports writing and really wanted to figure out how to be the football writer at the Washington Post. And at the time at, you know, at 21, didn't really want to go to like Fargo, no offense to Fargo, North Dakota, um, but didn't really want to go there to go be the football writer and the courts and the school's reporter all at the same, you know, I didn't, I didn't want to do that. Thinking, looking back on it now and seeing how broad the spectrum is of like digitally focused outlets that are not necessarily driven by hard copy circulation. I'm not, 
I'm not sure that if, if I re-simulated my life a hundred out of a, you know, a hundred times that I would choose this path, all 100 of them now. Um, I think the window, I think the, the space is much broader and much more diverse than it used to be. So did you know BuzzFeed just won a Polk Award? Yes, I did. They're doing great work. I mean, they, you know, holding the White House accountable and, you know, Ben Smith has gone from running BuzzFeed to like being the media critic at the New York Times. It's not like a bad, not a bad trajectory if you're looking at that sort of thing. And for me, looking at it when BuzzFeed started, it was like, you know, sort of, you know, lightweights. Now they're winning Polk Awards yeah. for coverage of Facebook, by the way. Yeah. Um, so, you know, somebody else, Raymond, you know, what, what made you switch? I think just, I was basically um, sad and depressed about the lay of the land in terms of where my career would be in journalism. I think, um, you know, Jeff hinted at this, um, you know, the trajectory for um, a person of color in journalism um, is not, uh, you know, wide open. Um, there's, there's, there are still challenges in the field, um, especially if you don't have the resources that a lot of other people have. Um, uh, you know, as a first generation immigrant who went to college, you know, it's, it's, it's tough to not have that support. Um, and part of that is like looking at, yes, you know, going to a more stable profession is great. You know, if, if I had the, all the resources in the world, I would stay in journalism, but um, that wasn't the best, for, that, was, that wasn't the best course for me. Yeah, I definitely get that. So Marissa asks those of you on small communications teams, she wants to know if, um, how you push yourself to grow as a writer and remain creative. Do you wanna take that? I'll take that one. I, um, World Central Kitchen's team, I also realized I forgot to say what World Central Kitchen is, but um, we're a disaster relief organization who works to uh, strengthen or serve communities and strengthen economies in times of crisis. So we started in 2010 um, by after an uh, earthquake in Haiti, providing meals to the community and have been working there ever since uh, at a culinary training program that we oversee. But after Hurricane Maria in 2017, our organization took on more of a disaster relief um, aura, I guess. And now we um, provide meals after natural disasters and some man-made disasters like um, the federal government shutdown of two years ago. Um, and we also have long-term programming in a lot of Caribbean countries where we provide grants to farmers, fishers, and food businesses to um, promote buying local fresh produce and strengthen the economies that are often hurt after disasters. And so to say that we started after 2017, our organization grew. And then throughout COVID, we've grown tremendously. So pre my being hired in last April, our communications team was like one and a half people. And now we have five full-time staff members, which is major in over just like five months that grew. Um, and I think I've struggled with that question a lot. I'm still a young alum. I only graduated like less than four years ago. And I think about all the time, like I'm at an associate level, but what can I do next? Where can I grow? And I don't know if I want to be the communications manager or if that person's leaving anytime soon. So how can I still continue to build my skills and show my, prove my worth? So I would recommend just asking to take on new things, dipping your toes in other pieces of the organization, like set up informational interviews with people around the organization and understand what the, what it is that they do. So you can figure out how you can help them out if they ever need something or show that you're available to do things that maybe your manager also does, but you can help your manager by taking on some of that work and improving your skills and help that other person who now realizes they can contact you if they need something or you're a really good writer. So they can ask you and they don't need to ask your manager not to undermine them, but like you can split the work um, and just really advocating for yourself and you don't need to step on anyone's toes to do that but saying I would love to learn what can I do how can I help and if you have anything specifically in mind don't be afraid to ask for it I would that's another piece of advice don't be afraid to ask for it people are more than happy to show you what they do or teach you something new people love talking about themselves so just be sure to ask and they will happily tell you and then you learn something new and have something else to bring to the table 
Anybody else? How do you stay creative? I think exploring different mediums is really a good way to do so. You know, I, I've done everything from write, you know, floor speeches for in Congress to helping do commencement remarks when we're for governor, but also like writing a really in-depth medium piece on, on the website medium.com for your boss is such like an interesting and unique way to visually tell a story in addition to all the traditional like op-ed piece that you'd have in there. Um, you know, as Tessa talked about telling a really fascinating story on Instagram, like if you work for an organization or principal with several hundred thousand followers, like I'd argue that you're going to get more impact from an incredible IG story that leads the viewer into a set of actions than an op-ed that's published in some national newspaper. Um, I think they're exploring those mediums is a really good way to challenge yourself because at the end of the day, you're, you're writing, you're doing some kind of writing, but how you do it and what form it takes, I mean, that keeps you on your toes for sure. And to piggyback on what Jeff said, Instagram, you know, when it came to the museum, I immediately knew right away my, there was limit in terms of my creativity. So I started my own, you know, Instagram handle called at Ray Museum to show behind the scenes of the interviews that, you know, and media um, events that we did. So, you know, when we had an event at at the U.S. Capitol, for example, I would show and take pictures and do some interviews uh, of some people or write quotes or things of that sort to go behind the scenes of what an institution like that is and to make sure that people know, you know, behind just the wall and showcase that. So, um, and you get to, you know, practice journalism in your own way. Yeah, I, you know, one of the things for me has been learning about um, all the different platforms and all the different ways to tell stories on these platforms. You know, that's how I kind of stay in touch with this, um, you know, brave new world, I guess. Um, Casey, got thoughts on uh, staying creative? I mean, I would agree with all of that, but I think, you know, um, I mean, I've had a lot of different types of jobs um, over the course of my career thus far. And I think one important sort of temperature check is, you know, when it's time to transition to something else, you know, like, you, so you try, so I think that, you know, everyone has really given some really good tips on how to keep your creative juices flowing, you know, where you are. But, you know, sometimes growth means that you have sort of extended, um, you sort of out, you, some growth sometimes means outgrowing where you are and the need to find somewhere else so that you can stretch and grow. And so it's just sort of important to kind of ask yourself, are you still learning? Are you still growing? Do you still feel like you have um, more room or still have ceiling, right? And then if you get to the point where, you know, you come in one day and you're like, the ceiling is a little lower than it felt like, you know, <laughs> a few weeks or a few months ago, then yeah, it's probably time to start thinking about going somewhere else and doing something else. And, and I think that that's just natural um, in any career and an important, again, temperature check to just not get bored or stale. I wholeheartedly agree. Any final thoughts from our panelists before we uh, get out of here? It's getting to be that time. Any questions from the audience? Uh, I just wanted to bring up something. You know, we do have an internship program at the museum and two Merrill grads have uh, gone and have internships here and, um, you know, they're using their journalism skills. And so it's on pause right now, but we are bringing it back once COVID hopefully ends. So just be on the lookout too. I'm all in favor of that. Somebody get that internship, <laughs> jump on it. Um, panelists, thank you. You guys are wonderful people. You're wonderful for coming back. Um, it's great to see you, a bunch of you have had in class, which is incredible. Um, so I love you all and you know, you're wonderful alumni for coming back and talking to us. Thanks, Thanks for having us. Thanks for having thank us. you.
Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much, everyone. Um, and just a reminder for everyone, we will have this and the other panels um, up on our YouTube page starting tomorrow morning. Um, and for everyone who had registered for any of the panels throughout the week, we'll be sending out an email with links to all of those. So if you missed one of the earlier ones or you joined this one late, um, we'll have those available for you to watch. So um, thanks again to all of our panelists and uh, hope everyone has a good evening. You too. See y'all later. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone.